Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. It's time for another Erasure video once again, and this time we're looking at the evolvement of Erasure's live sound. If you've been on this channel for a while, you will know that I am a huge Erasure fan, and that stems from the fact that I am a massive Vince Clark fan. Um, I think Vince Clark has done amazing things with electronic music and I think he is one of the absolute pioneers of electronic music and has gone on to influence modern music the way we know it. Now whether you're a fan of Vince Clark or not, I, I've often said I find it virtually impossible to separate the notion of Vince Clark from electronic music and I therefore feel if you're a fan of synthesizer or electronic music, it's virtually impossible not to be a fan of Vince Clark. I mean, you might not be a fan of the songs and everything, but if you're a producer of electronic music, you're, you're gonna have to give him kudos and, and, and pay homage to him for, you know, the sounds and everything that he did. Um, to me, when I first heard Erasure many years ago, I always referred to it as craft work with a song. And of course, that is completely inaccurate because it doesn't sound like Kraftwerk. Of course, Vince Clark was hugely influenced by Kraftwerk, and you, you can obviously hear a lot of the, the, the a lot of the sounds and the way he put them together. You could hear he obviously was hugely influenced by Kraftwerk, as well, you know, everyone who did it at the time. But Vince Clark was one of the very first who very successfully managed to marry the that electronic sound with a pop song because you must remember when when the pioneers came out let's talk about craft work and i will be bringing out a craft work video i promise you but when craft work came out with their sort of robotic thick stock v are their robots thing it wasn't everyone's cup of tea a lot of people saw it as very theatrical the people that loved it really loved it and the people that didn't like it hated it it was kind of like it people were very divided on it uh, some people didn't take it serious a lot of people said it wasn't real music it was pretentious whatnot but along comes Vince Clark and he quite successfully manages to take that electronic sound and bring it to the mainstream and of course there were others as well but Vince Clark did have a distinct sound and really much does at the moment and there are many reasons as to why Yazoo was very successful and a Yazoo video is coming as well, I promise you. Now the success of Yazoo is not only to do with the fact that Alison Moyet is a phenomenal vocalist and, and, and with Vince's great knowledge of, you know, of how to present a pop song. I think what a lot of people who aren't Vince Clark or Erasure fans don't seem to understand is that the success of Erasure, Yazoo, and indeed the early Depeche Mode stuff, was not so much the electronic sound, although that was a big part of it. It all comes down to great songwriting. Now, I'm here to tell you, and I'll debate this with anyone, that Yazoo would have not been successful if it were not for those great songs. Forget the fact that Alison Moyet was an incredible singer, and Vince Clark was great with synthesizers and had a great sound. Forget about that. It is, it all comes down to the songs. When you haven't got the songs, you haven't got anything. In the words of Rusty Egan, you haven't got it, you haven't got it. <laughs> so the success of Yazoo, as, as it is with Eurasia, is down to great songwriting. And it absolutely is. Now to demonstrate what I mean by great songwriting, if you watch my video I did on Eurasia synth pop perfection, you will see what I did in that video. It was kind of like an introduction, um, about Erasure from myself and I was just breaking down some of the songs on piano you know Erasure being an electronic act and that is something that this channel is becoming um, well known for is where I take s electronic songs and instead of playing them on the synthesizer I like to show people what's behind the scenes I like to strip away all the electronics the synthesized sound so you're not distracted by that and just get into the bare bones of you know the chords and the songs and so you can hear the melody and by playing the songs on just a straightforward piano sound you can then hear without distraction how great and harmonically rich the songs are and how brilliant they are 
Songs like I Love to Hate You, Blue Savannah Song, Ship of Fools. I mean, the, the Vince Clark catalog is just ridiculously successful. Now, I've mentioned Yazoo, and then there was that brief collaboration, The Assembly, and I, I, I really feel we should talk about The Assembly one day. I really don't feel that Fergal Sharkey um, got enough uh, time to do. And of course, I, I understand that the idea with The Assembly, I think it was meant to be like a revolving door. It was meant to be, you know, Vince Clark's project and working with different singers. So I don't know what happened there, but anyway. They ended up with Erasure, and that is what this video is all about. Now, in this video, I really want to talk about the evolvement of Erasure's live sound. Now, this is going to be quite a general video. We're going to just sort of scratch the surface, and then from your feedback at the end, that is going to help me decide in which direction to take the future Erasure videos. Let me just put this out there. My very, very favorite Erasure album of all times is Chorus. Uh, I remember someone in my channel saying that Chorus was kind of like Erasure's Violator. And sorry, we always have to reference Depeche Mode, but we all say, I think all Depeche Mode fans will say Violator, best album. And I think saying that Chorus was kind of like Erasure's Violator is, I think, very, very appropriate because that was a great album. And I only learned very recently when I was interviewing Dave Bascombe that Dave Bascombe actually mixed that record and I would love to head back for an interview with Dave Bascombe at some point, and we can interview him and talk about the mixing of this chorus album. One of my favorite live Erasure concerts was the, the Tank, the Swan, and the Balloon. And forgive me, another Depeche Mode reference. And that concert to me, the Tank, the Swan, the Balloon, that was like Erasure's version of Depeche Mode's devotional. That to me was like Erasure's highest point. That was an, an incredible show, The Tank, The Swan and The Balloon. I will leave links to that in the description below so you can watch that out. Now, when you say the word Erasure to me, I just smile. It is synonymous with feeling good. And it's funny because I love dark, moody music, but I make an exception for Erasure. I love Erasure. Take the start of The Tank, The Swan and The Balloon. I'll never forget Andy Bell coming on dressed like a big swan and then that siren song. And the ever faithful I endure to listen for the sound of the siren song. Ragged whispers. Beautiful. And then, <laughs> and then there's that scene after the first song where I think in the initial part of the song, the first time you see Vince Clark, he comes dressed like a deep sea diver. And then just as Siren's song finishes, he comes on in this tank. Now, let's talk about that tank. That tank had synthesizers and modules and drum machines and everything all the way to the roof, to the bottom. They were strapped in and everything. Now, I always thought that was just for show. However, I learned not so long ago, that everything was apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, apparently everything was wired up. All those synthesizers were, were live. They were all rigged up. Now, if you understand how temperamental analog synthesizers are, you will know that that was a very dangerous thing to do, to take that amount of analog synthesizers onto a stage and do that. But this was Vince Clark, the purist. Um, and I, I, I know he likes... He loves analog. I think at one point he said he only used analog. Um, but I think later on he did delve into digital and everything. But that, that is a separate video. But the sheer sight of Vince Clark coming out in that tank with all those synthesizers and modules and drum machines and whatnot was very, very impressive. And as, as I said, I always thought it was just for show. But apparently everything was wired up and it was all... He was you know, firing off sequences and whatnot. Wow, and I just think that is a very dangerous thing to do. Now let's fast forward to the present date. Have you seen Erasure Live recently? Fantastic, but Vince Clark has really, really scaled it down and he's really made it easy for himself. I mean, it's basically just a tiny little controller keyboard, two or three octave and, and, and a MacBook Pro. Now, I had a friend who said ever since he saw Vince Clark coming onto 
stage with what he called a kid's keyboard and a laptop. This friend of mine just said, I'm not having this anymore. Now this mate of mine is a real uh, uh, synth guru and he loves his synthesizers and stuff. And he's a big fan of Vince Clark. And when he saw Vince Clark, as in current days where he comes out now with a, you know, a little keyboard and laptop, this friend of mine just decided, nah, I'm not having this. <laughs> now, my response to that is I can see where you're coming from. But then again, Vince Clark has nothing to prove. He has done his time. If Vince Clark wants to come out onto stage with a MacBook Pro and a tiny little controller keyboard, as I say, he's done his time. This was the guy who used to come out in a tank <laughs> with synthesizers strapped to the roof. I remember there was a, was it a, a Jupiter 8 strapped to the top there and, and loads of other synthesizers. And so yeah, he's done his time. He's got nothing to prove. And I think from a performance point of view, um, I've, I've watched in interviews how Andy Bell has talked about how Vince, you know, Vince looks very serious on stage and that's because apparently he's, I believe he was quite stressed. He was always worried things would go wrong. And you would be if you took that amount of analog equipment onto the stage. So, you know, for the purists who go, oh, he's bringing a laptop onto stage now. That, okay, we get that. And of course it does not look as impressive, but at the end of the day, it's all down to the show. Now, what I want to talk about is I've just been listening to the World Be Gone tour, um, you know, and I went to see, when did I go see Erasure live? Probably about three years ago. And I've probably seen them live about six or seven times. And, you know, it's always a blast. It's absolutely brilliant. Any friend of mine I've ever taken to an Erasure concert has always been won over. Um, yeah, it is one of the most entertaining shows you could ever see. But I want to talk now, and this is not criticism, this is just, and this is something you would probably not pick up unless you were a producer or a, or a geek like myself. But something I noticed, not so much when I was at the concert, but listening back to the concerts on headphones, I noticed that the, the backing tracks, which are now used in the live performances, um, they almost sound a little bit generic in a way, and I'm not being rude. They just sound almost like they were programmed by someone else and not by Vince Clark. And what I mean by that is Vince Clark has a very distinctive sound. Now, if you listen to Erasure albums, the current albums, they still have that Erasure, Erasure-ish sound. And although synthesizers have evolved and whatnot, there is, when you listen to certain music, even before Andy Bell sings, you can go, that's Vince Clark. The point I'm making is when you listen to the in this case, the World Be Gone tour, the music, the backing tracks, they almost sound a little bit generic. And they all, dare I say, they sound a little bit Eurovision. They, they seem to be lacking that Vince Clark type sound. Now, I understand, I understand that when you do live music, your sole intention is to ensure that the music translates well. Now, this is why, let's take dance music. Dance music is kind of like a tried and trust, trusted formula. If we listen to how dance music has evolved, and of course that is another subject. I was listening to Rhythm is a Dancer the other day. <laughs> Snap's Rhythm is a Dancer. Love Snap. Why am I talking about Snap? Well, when I was listening to Rhythm is a Dancer, which is one of the most outstanding dance tracks ever, what was interesting listening to it, now that I have not listened to it in many years, was to realize how music production and electronic music, how the production has changed. Now, listening to Rhythm is a Dancer is, when you haven't listened to it in a long time, what I noticed listening to it is now is it doesn't seem to have the impact that I remember it having. And one, and, and there are many reasons for that, but something I noticed about that was the kick that was going boom, boom. It's probably like an 808 kick sound or something. It's very fat, but it doesn't seem to cut through the mix as, you know, kick drums do in modern EDM and stuff. And that is a video, a completely separate video 
But the point I'm trying to make is, is that as dance music has evolved, we have learned a lot about, you know, when you have a kick, for instance, instead of, if you've got like a fat kick drum, you'd put like a click sound at the top, so that it kind of cuts through the mix. If you're a producer, you will know what I'm, I mean. Now, listening back to Rhythm is a Dancer, despite the fact that it's perfectly produced, it appears to me that the certain, you know, there are certain things that we have learned over the years, which are now, which we now include in our productions, which were not present in those days. So listening to Rhythm is a Dancer is, you know, it's energetic and everything, but had it been produced today, it would have, they, they would have used more modern techniques and done things like, you know, put, put the click, snap sound on the, on the kick to make it punch through. If you're a producer, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not a producer, I'm not trying to lose you here. Now, the reason I'm speaking about Rhythm is a Dancer is because not only is it a classic track, one of my favorite dance songs of all times, but I'm trying to illustrate to you that how dance music has evolved. Now, erasure is not dance music. However, it's electronic music and the two are very related, obviously, and they do cross over. So this is where my comment on the on the current erasure sound comes in, is that it's very, not so much, I'm not talking about the records, I'm talking about the live sound. The live sound has a very almost Eurovision type sound, which I'm not very keen on, and I'm not criticizing it. Now, when, as I say, when I'm at the concerts, it sounds great. And the point I'm saying is, is that when they are producing music to perform live, they need to consider that the music sounds as good as it possibly can. And that is why, if you listen to the music in the live performances now, there seems to be like a doom, 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 a very heavy kick drum. And I understand that because that, you know, it's that heavy kick drum that provides the energy. But it was just upon analysis, listening to the live performances of late, it sounds a little bit Eurovision-y. And I'm a little bit questionable on some of the sounds that they're using. Nothing wrong with it, personal opinion. It almost just sounds to me, if you listen to, in this case, the Will Be Gone tour, when the music starts and you just take away Andy's voice, it sounds to me like cover music. It sounds to me like it was produced by someone else and not Vince Clark. This is just my personal opinion, guys. I'm not criticizing it. I, I still love their shows and everything. I just, I'm just questioning some of the, the sounds that they use because they don't sound very Vince Clarky. Now that's not to say they're bad. They just don't sound very Vince Clarky to me. And I would love to know what your opinion is on that. There are many examples of this and obviously too many for me to illustrate in this video. But one of the examples is is, is if I look at the song All Amour, it's got that bam, ba da bam, bam, ba da bam, 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 bam. It has this, the sound they're using on the live shows. It's got this real sort of like, uh, it's kind of like a, a really Eurovision type sound. It's something like, Now that's not a bad sound and you know once again that's not the exact sound that they're using but it has got that kind of it's that kind of like Eurovision-y type sound. Um, now once again there is a reason they do that because that type of sound cuts through a mix and it, it's it's all about the energy and the impact and I don't want you to misunderstand me here. I'm not saying I don't like the sounds they're using. I'm just saying the sounds in the records sound very much erasure -y, but when you hear them live, it doesn't sound very erasure -y. It sounds like someone else had programmed the backing tracks. I hope you understand what I mean by that, and I would love to know what you, what you think of it. Now, it's up to you. I would like to hear your comments. What do you think of Erasure's live sound um, the way it is at the moment? Once again, I'm not criticizing it. I just feel... It doesn't sound like Vince Clark is programming the music anymore. It's almost like they're using someone else to do that. And once again, I understand why that is done. It's because the sounds and the way it's presented is the most effective way to get that, you know, to project sound. As I say, a, a, this type of sound. 
even though it's a very sort of Eurovision type sound, it does tend to cut through a mix. And it's, you know, it's, if, 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 if you're doing a live show, it does work. It's got that epic type sound. Although my taste, I, I'm not a fan of that Eurovision type sound. You know what I mean? So guys, leave your comments. I would love to know what you think about this. Um, and also anything on the subject of Eurasia that you want me to elaborate on. I would like to start a album review series as well as I'm doing with the Depeche Mode album review series. Probably not as in depth, but I would like to review some uh, Eurasia albums in chronological order because I do love Eurasia. It's up to you guys. Please leave your comments below. Um, please, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Um, there is a Facebook group and a Facebook page. Links to all that below. Thank you for your time once again, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. All the best, my friends. Adios.